Uh, You've got to see opportunities and seize them. The greatest untapped resource in Canada is the wisdom of the elder. I thought I wouldn't get married again because how many times do you go to the altar and say, I do, and then you walk away and you didn't? Welcome to Episode 8 of Elder Wisdom, Stories from the Green Bench. This podcast explores everything, love, life, friendship, learning, triumph, and tragedy, and so much more told by older adults. I'm your host for this bi-weekly podcast. My name is Erin Davis. Now, while podcasting is kind of a new thing to a lot of people, storytelling is as old as time. In fact, it's one of those things in radio that I love the most, the virtual connection. And today we keep that going, and we're doing it seemingly against some pretty big odds with laughter and deep precious. Joining me as he always does Lloyd Hetherington. He's 85, a widower, father, grandfather, a retired teacher and missionary, and like so many fellow seniors at Schlegel Village's retirement and long-term care homes in Ontario, Lloyd has a lot of stories to tell, wisdom to share, and questions to ask. So let's get at him. And Lloyd joins us here today on the Green Bench, a symbol of elder wisdom, a place to share a conversation or give and offer advice, and today to have some laughs. We are delighted to have on the Green Bench with us here with Lloyd and with me, Dee. Now, I saw on a YouTube video she was Dee Brown, but that's not the whole story. There's a whole nother name in there, and she's going to help me to to get that right, because Lloyd, we like to get something right right off the bat, right? Right on. Okay, so Dee, please introduce yourself. Well, I've got a name that looks like somebody just threw the alphabet against the wall, and people get stressed to say it right. So I tell them right off the bat, just call me Dee Precious, and they kind of relax. And it, wow. it, it's a different perspective. If you're meeting Dee Precious, and then if you hear Dee Precious, you kind of relax and go, okay, I'm in for the story. And delightful. I have a feeling this chat is going to be, just from having met you before we did this today, you have such an amazing outlook on life, and I don't want to focus simply on the Parkinson's, but this is kind of what illuminates everything for us with you. First off, you're a resident in Waterloo at University Gates and a younger resident, too. You're 66, is that right? That's correct. So tell us about your Parkinson's, your diagnosis back in 2003, and what you did with that information when you got it, Dee? Well, it's an interesting story because I'm, I'm a nurse. That's my, my background is nursing. And when I was given the diagnosis, the doctor was very firm that it was absolutely Parkinson's and that in six years I would be in a wheelchair. And I said to him, are you sure? And he said, Dee, you know, this medication that we're talking about isn't going to save you from a wheelchair. He said, um, even if you pray and even God won't keep you out of a wheelchair, you'll be in a wheelchair in six, six years. And um, he said, I'm 80% sure it's Parkinson's. And I said, well, that's great. That gives me 20%. I can work with it. And he said, no, D, if it's the 20 other percent would be Parkinson's plus. I said, well, that still sounds good. Anytime I was in school, if I got a plus, that was a good thing. He said, D. <laughs> and I said, well, if I add it up, that leaves you with 100%, and you're leaving me with nothing. And I said, that's not going to work for me. I need to have some something to work with. He said, the only thing that's going to help you get through these six years, and this was in 2002, he said, is um, this medication. And I said, well, I need to think about this. So I went home and I thought about it. And I've often compared illnesses or, or anything um, that's not working right to my car. And if my red light comes on engine, if I put a band-aid on it, to me that's not being very um, astute to the warning that there's something going on under the engine. And I felt like at that time, if I took the medication, that I would mask that there was a problem because uh, he had 100% and I had nothing. So I went home and it took me a while before I did start the medication, but I'm so glad that I took that time because it changed the whole journey for me. Um, 
It took me in different places. Let's explain to people who don't know. Maybe they know Parkinson's disease from Michael J. Fox or from Muhammad Ali or Linda Ronstadt or Neil Diamond, Alan Alda. The list of people that we know with Parkinson's and, of course, in our own communities as well. It's an incurable neurogenerative disease affecting movement, balance, and coordination. There are, for some people, tremors, slowness of movement, loss of balance. And here you are 17 years into that diagnosis, D, and you say that you're dancing with Parkinson's. Is that metaphorical or literal? Tell us about that. It's, it's two ways. Uh, at the time I, I learned about music and therapy for Parkinson's, There was no research happening 15 years ago. And one day my daughter came over to visit and she brought us a song by, was it Michael Buble? Yeah, Michael Buble was singing a Christmas song, All I Want Mm -hmm. for Christmas. And that certain beat, you could just feel it. I could just feel it in my bones. And I said to her, I said, help me get up off the chair. Because at that time I was sitting in one of those recliner chairs that had a motorized help me stand up out of a chair. And she said, Mom, and I said, no, I really feel I can move. It was that certain beat that I got up, and I, I was moving like crazy. So oh. I was also a member of the Y, and I was doing exercises, and I said to them, look at this, look what happens. I would have trouble moving, and then this music would come on, and it would be so magical. So that got me started on knowing that sometimes the right beat of music could help. And now when you look around, there's so much advancement in music and exercise and how you think to help us get to be the best place we can be with whatever it is life's giving us. Yeah, even the Parkinson Canada website says that dancing improves balance and gait even long after the activity ends. That's really amazing. And you were kind of ahead of the curve on that, it seems. I was. I was ahead of the curve on... The, the music, and I also was on the, ahead of the curve on the meditating because I was telling my neurologist what was happening with my with me, and he said, well, I see the difference, Steve, but I didn't know what it was, and I said, well, are you going to tell other people? And he said, well, we don't really have the scientific evidence, and I said, yeah, you know, just yeah, but I'm I'm here showing you what the difference can be, and now now it's wonderful, so we've come a long way to know how to deal with some of these things, whether it's Parkinson's or whether it's depression or whether it's whatever it is. The body has to keep moving no matter what. Oh, Dee, you've just confirmed that music is good medicine and you've applied it to yourself. You're sharing it with so many other people now and uh, I'm just delighted the way you are conquering this challenge through the the medium of music. Do you have any activity where you live with musical exercises? Well, yes, I was doing that at home. I made, not all music can help me get up and dance. Um, Or if my body is really rigid, uh, the right music can help me loosen up and I can, I I can be amazing. And so I had my own little routine and then I joined the the gym. They were starting to introduce um, a little bit more music. And here at uh, University Gates, They've got all kinds of exercises. We've got Tai Chi happening right now because we're, we can't be in big crowds. We're all gathering on our own floors at different days to do stretching and music and, and different kinds of body moving. So yeah, there's lots of opportunity to, to be part of the, the movement here. And they, they have a kinesiologist here that is amazing. She just helps us with whatever we need. But music is a big thing. You're right on the ground floor there. You are creating the programs there, and uh, people for years to come will benefit from what you have been doing now. That's true, and I'm benefiting from people's actions before me, too. You're quite an ambassador for exercise and good health. I hear that you've uh, actually been out on speaking engagements. That's true. Um, going back to the exercises, I, I, I sometimes I, I talk more than I, I move. Sometimes the, the talking is easier than the walking. So I have to walk my talk and talk my walk. And laughing. As Mary Pettibone Poole said, he who laughs lasts. Tell us what your spirit, your humor, your attitude has done in the 17 years since your Parkinson's diagnosis and how it gets you out of bed every day. That, that's a really good question because laughter is so important. And they do say laughter is the best medicine. And now there's science behind it. And when you laugh, you, you release certain hormones that are happy hormones. And when you're not laughing, 
and you're looking at the darker side, there's other hormones that can get you into depression and, and you, you get out of a, a happy spot. Now, I, I've got to clear that you don't want to be in denial. You don't want to laugh and pretend that things aren't importantly changing for you, but you want to laugh because you're laughing with the disease because you got two choices. You can either be down all the time or you can look at it on the lighter side. And I discovered that I laughter just was a, a natural gift for me. So laughter isn't easy for everybody. So I give them some tools. Like, for example, have you ever had somebody come for dinner that you really didn't want to be there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, all you have to do is serve corn on the cob because you can't eat corn on the cob without a smile. <laughs> and when you're smiling like that, your brain is already releasing all the chemicals that you need to feel better. So, and if you're at work and you, you, you're having a difficult time and you don't feel like laughing and you think, oh, I've heard Dee talk about laughing and she's just not re in the reality of, of life. But all you have to do at work if you're, if you're feeling down is put a pencil in your mouth. Like it looks like you're really thinking about the next thing you're going to do. And really what you're doing is you're making myself, yourself smile and nobody knows it. But smile, laughter, laughter is, is so key. So key. Now, when I, was t when I was talking about laughter way back 15, 17 oh. years ago, the corporate world didn't really see the benefit because it was a non-tangible. Non but laughter can help bring people together. Mm -hmm. if, if you're together as a group in the corporate world and you've got some problems, if you can laugh about something, then you're laughing together and then you're ready to face the problem or the challenge with critical thinking. So laughter fits in everywhere, uh -huh. and if it's if it's if you're not feeling like you have to laugh, all you have to do is say ha ha, ho ho, he he, and <laughs> the the chemicals are already released in your body, and now it's scientifically proven. Right. Yep. Yep. Got the it. endorphins. Absolutely. Uh, you're so contagious with that enthusiasm, with that laughter. I suspect that anyone in your company will be laughing in no time at all. Just keep that up. It is contagious. That's for sure. And it doesn't have to be real, but when you start laughing and you just laugh and you don't know what you're laughing at, the next thing you know is you're in a belly laugh and you, when you're done, you feel so relieved. <laughs> and there's something called laugh therapy. Even Parkinson'sDisease.net has focus on that. And it's a really good resource if you or someone you know is living with Parkinson's disease. Yep, you've got it. Dee, you got yourself a guru. You went inside when you learned of your diagnosis. Tell us about your spiritual journey a little bit, would you? Well, that's where we go back to the medication. If I'd have taken the medication, I would have had a different journey. And I got to be clear, I'm telling people, do not stop your medication. And if it feels right to you to go on your medication, follow your neurologist because they're very knowledgeable. But for me, it just wasn't the right time and I had no idea why. But what Parkinson's did for me is it took me down what I call the rabbit hole. And I resisted. I did not want to go down the rabbit hole. And then finally I surrendered. And I found in life that if I anything you resist, it persists. So I decided I was just going to sit with this and, and just uh, see where it took me. And lo and behold, it, wasn't, it didn't take very long before I attracted a guru. And it was after I was diagnosed and I went to a lot of different people to help me decide what, what to eat, what kind of therapies to try. And I was doing like 10 different therapies. And finally I said, you know what? I'm quitting you all because I never asked D myself what I needed. Mm -hmm. So I took some time away and that's when I attracted this guru. This person came up to me and they said, um, come to my office and I can have a person that I would like you to meet. This is a spiritual leader from India. If you'd like to meet him, I thought, well, so I went and I just as well, I was in awe. I couldn't understand what he was saying, but my body knew what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And then this was in October. In December, I was flying to India for three months to live on an ashram and travel with this Indian um, guru. It was an amazing, amazing trip. And learning to meditate, I realized that my outer world was getting smaller because of Parkinson's and my inner world was getting bigger. And then I started learning that we're seeing everything on the outside and we're ignoring our inside. Yeah. And if you just sit and you don't even know how to meditate, if you just sit and listen to your breath, you're already meditating and you feel different. Very much so. You need those quiet times. You need to look deep within. You need to sense that to base those values and listen very carefully to what the Spirit is saying to you. Dee, you've given a remarkable example of that. 
far too many people look for answers outside through the medication, through the bottle, through the drugs. In reality, there is the answer within. You know what is good for you. And the challenge is to follow through on that. And and that's that's so true because um, when I was ready to start my medication, the difference was that the experiences that I had experienced took the fear away. I realized that I was still in control of my body. I was still in control of the medication I was taking. And it was now time because I wasn't taking it out of fear. Because when you do things out of fear, things don't flow. So when I was ready to take the medication, it, it was five years later, but oh, the things that happened in those five years and the, th the, the ideas that I got in my meditations, I, I would never have thought of them myself. And I would have never have gone to India if it hadn't have been for that one opportunity that I was listening to my, my inner self. Also to teach the nurses that how, how powerful humor was, I created this creature called the nurse from hell. And I carried all these extra tools around and I was there to debrief them when they were having hard times. So we would laugh. And this is really important about laughter is because there's dark humor. And dark mm -hmm. humor helps people move through their... If you're at a workplace and something happens, you know, there's a death if you're working at the hospital and you need to go to the next patient, you've got to debrief and, and, and move that, that sorrow that you're feeling through that, that time. So black humor is really good to help move that. But if somebody hears you that is not on the same wavelength for black humor, they could be really offended by what you're saying. So, And humor can also be a tool that you hide behind, and it can be sarcastic. So humor can build bridges, and it can also destroy bridges. So we've, we've got to be careful that we're lifting people up with the humor and not putting them down. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It reminds me of this saying, and my grandmother used to say it, and it was that we cannot direct the wind, but we can adjust the sails. So you got this blast of wind and decided you were going to set sail and even, you know, to India, metaphorically. And then I want to talk about, well, if we're going to go with the sailing metaphor, how about the love boat? You've got to tell us about how you have met your life partner and the role that he has in your life now, Dee, because this has been an incredible chat with you today. We've talked about your challenges, your indomitable strength, laughter, and now we get to the page on romance. Would you share that with us here today? I love your story. <laughs> well, I had two, two trial runs in marriage, and I learned what not to do and what to do and what to respect and what not to buy into. And then on my third time, well, I thought I wouldn't get married again because how many times do you go to the altar and say, I do, and then you walk away and you didn't? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had a girlfriend at, at church, and she came and introduced me to her boyfriend, and I, I said, how did you meet? And she said, through the Internet. And I went, how the heck does somebody meet somebody on the Internet? I've been on the Internet to look for recipes. I've been on the Internet to look for information. And there was no man just waiting for me there. And she said, oh, Dee, you've got to make a profile. I said, okay, this sounds like fun. So I made a profile, and uh, then this person by the name of Dave popped in. I thought, okay, I'll meet up with him. So we met at um, Swiss Chalet. Neither one of us are coffee drinkers, so we said, why don't we meet over at a butterscotch Sunday? And he said, well, I like chocolate Sunday. I said, okay, we'll meet on, you have chocolate, I'll have butterscotch. So I got to the Swiss Chalet first. And I, he likes to read the newspaper, I knew. So I was reading the newspaper, but little did I know I was upside down when he came there. <laughs> so I didn't impress him so much with the newspaper. Ah! But we hit it off, and I met him while we were seeing if I what my diagnosis was. And when I got the diagnosis, we were engaged, and I said to Dave, you know, hon, I said, this thing can get really big. Why don't we just stay friends and... Uh, you can walk the path with me. And he said, no way. He said, I'm in it for the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, honey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm walking around with like, these senior people, these people that are age wisdom, and they're looking younger than me. I did not know the good, bad, and the ugly was that maybe it was me that was going to get ugly. And he said, oh, honey, you <laughs> look the same as when we married each other. He said, I'm in it for the long haul. Now, so he's been really a good, a good partner for me. And now he's got his own challenges for the last four years. He's been, he had prostate cancer, so he had oh. surgery. He had uh, radiation because he's so young, they were thinking out of the box. Yeah. So he had the surgery, the radiation, he had the chemo, and now he's on um, hormonal drugs. And he's also waiting for a hip replacement. 
and myself at this stage of seven after 17 years of Parkinson's, it's it's making its face more obvious. So my daughter said to me, Mom, she said, I can see differences in you and Dad. And she said, I was thinking about this place that's right five minutes from us. It's uh, called University Gates. I said, I know, that's where our family doctor is. And she said, well, it's a retirement home, 10 floors up. And she said, I'd like you to come and take a look at it. She said, I want you to be in the place that you can enjoy yourself. And then if there's a crisis, then we can handle the crisis really easily. So we came and took a look at this, and it was awesome. It was so awesome. And the one thing about this place is it's not only nice on the inside and the outside, but if I had to guess, I would say that it's been built on spiritual grounds because there's just something about it. There's something magical in the air. I can't quite explain it. But the first day I was here, a lady came over and she said, we need to talk. There's something that you need to say to somebody. And I said, who? And she said, I don't know yet. But she said, we'll find it. Mm. And the next thing I knew is somebody came up and said, hey, Dee. Would you like to do a podcast? And I said, oh my gosh, it happened so quickly. <laughs> wow. So the, yeah, so the magic, the magic is in the air. And a couple of people have said that too. It's not, it's not the, the woodwork that looks so nice. And it's not the staff that are treating us good. It's all a combination, but there's something, there's something here that I don't feel in every place that I go. Dee, you are the spirit and the spark, and that's what you bring to everybody else. And it doesn't escape my attention that you and Dave met when you got diagnosed with Parkinson's, and yet you're giving the gift of your spirit to him as he journeys through cancer through this fourth stage now, and he has given back to you. It's all about the giving and the receiving, isn't it? Being open to it all. It is. It is. And when we go to the doctors, they don't really know who the patient is because now Dave's walking with a walker just to help him get through. Till He's been on the list for two years to wait for a hip replacement. And we just got, he's going to get it done in January. Well, you tell Dave he doesn't have to dance with you every single time till he gets that new hip, okay? Just tell I'll, him, sit this one out. I will let him know that. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and you know what else I love? I love how your daughter called him dad. She, they've got a really good relationship. That's marvelous. Really good, yeah. And mm, I, when yeah. I heard that, when I heard her call him dad, it was like, ah, oh. you know, he's an amazing man and he's an amazing grandpa. He's a bald headed guy, a little bit short, and he has wisdom that is unbelievably uh, unimportant. <laughs> and when he, when he talks, the kids he he teaches the kids all kinds of things. He says I've got lots of knowledge, but it's all tidbit stuff, and the kids just love it. One day, the granddad grandson said, "You know, Papa," he said, "You don't have any hair because you've got so much knowledge in your head that there's not a room for a follicle." <laughs> and I, then we laughed about that, and then she said, um, "And Papa, you're so smart, but you're not smart Alec about it. You're just so smart and entertaining." And so they they just love them to pieces. Oh. Wow. It sounds like you've got your own in-home Buddha, just the way you describe oh. him. <laughs> oh, he, yeah. He, yeah, he is my Buddha. He is my earth angel. You have a mutual admiration society going there. <laughs> and it's fantastic how you support each other. And the, I, I just love the value you brought for it to, to your marriage. We said you're in it for the long haul, the good, the bad, the ugly. Most, most people get into it and they let, don't mind the good, but when the bad and the ugly show up, they want to get out. But you you have proven that uh, a good, caring relationship just makes all the difference in the world. They're to support each other and to encourage each other on. I agree. And one, one word to people out there, even before you get out of bed, decide it's going to be a good day. And then whatever happens, it's good. You just don't know it. It's like watching the chicken come out of an egg. It looks like it's breaking, but it's actually expanding its life. It's, it's its life that you're seeing. So don't try not to break your egg. Expand and just expect the best. And the best may be hard, and it may be tragic, and it may be hard to move through it. But when we come out of the end, there, there's something to say for our attitude. Our attitude is, is really important. And you've just confirmed again that inner spirit that you have decided that it's going to be a good day. Circumstances don't dictate it. Your spirit within dictates what the day will be like. 
And of course, part of that attitude, as you mentioned, Lloyd, that positive spirit, it comes out in, in what you've said, Dee, that you wouldn't change a thing with your diagnosis, but it doesn't mean that you don't cry and yell and and express your frustration with what has happened in your life. What do you do with that? What do you do with those feelings, Dee? Oh, that, that's a big question. Sometimes I just stomp around the house. Sometimes I just watch Netflix. And now more than ever, I sit in meditation and I just go, okay, now I'll sit with my feelings. And instead of saying, go away, you're bad or good, I'm just saying, you're, you're, what, what do I do with this? Help me see this a different way. And something will happen that will shift it or that I, I can talk to somebody about it. Um, but I'm not ever talking about denying. Be real with yourself. And sometimes friends can help us and sometimes we need professional help. Don't let your pride get in the way to help you be the best person you can be. If you're feeling low, what I often did was I had a perky parky person party. Parky as in Parkinson's. Okay, the yeah. perfect parky Perfect. And we'd, we'd have to wear purple, whether we got together in person. We'd, <laughs> we'd celebrate that we have something to celebrate. But really, it's so easy to wish we had something different, but we don't know what that life would be. You know, if I said, okay, give me something different, and I, I came with um, ALS or I came with something else, there's always challenges. And I believe the challenge is to make us stronger people. Like, why? what are we here for on this earth anyway? Just to... To, to be the best we can be, There's, that's a that's a big question and a big answer that I have no idea. You do have lots of ideas. That's that's perfect, Dee. <laughs> Dee, you're a tower of strength. You really are. And what a wonderful example to share with others. Dee, you're living proof of your own belief in the law of attraction. You and Dave attracted each other. We've all kind of come together today. And uh, we can't thank you enough for sharing your wisdom here on the Green Bench today. It's just been such a gift Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we wish you a peaceful mind and heart and good health with whatever comes your way in the months and years to come. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Lloyd, and thank you, Dee. Right now, we'd like to take a moment to remember our special guest from Episode 4, Early this year, and just days after the passing of her husband Stan at age 95, we lost Louise Joliffe, also 95. She spoke with us of her career, being fired because she was pregnant, of forgiveness about that, of travel, of creating needlework and crocheting and knitting with those arthritic hands, and most indelibly, of her life partner, a Second World War veteran and lifetime Mason. 73 years of Marriage is a long time. I love him dearly, and I I want to be with him. And she is with her Stan now and always. Please take a moment to go back to Episode 4 and relive our chat with Louise Joliffe, and our hearts go out to their children, grandchildren, and extended family and friends who will miss them, as will we. I hope you'll join Lloyd and me again. And just before we move on from the green bench and get ready for our next chat with a resident and radio veteran, Doug Reed, please subscribe for additional episodes every two weeks. You'll be notified just as soon as they're up. And we invite you to please share your thoughts and opinions on social media using hashtag Elder Wisdom to help others find us on this green bench. Just take a moment to rate and review the Elder Wisdom podcast. And if it's easier, go to elderwisdom.ca to find the link. While you're there, take the Elder Wisdom Pledge. I did. I'm Erin Davis, and thank you for your time, and we'll talk to you again soon. Your seat on the green bench is ready and waiting. Elder Wisdom, Stories from the Green Bench, is brought to you by Schlegel Villages, a complete continuum of care, offering independent living to long-term care, celebrating and honoring the wisdom of the elder. To learn more about us, please go to our website, schlegelvillages.com.